What is the percentage chance of you making a million dollars this year legally? And if you don't, every single person that you love gets murdered. Today, I'm gonna to be giving you five different keys to stop procrastinating and stop being so freaking lazy. And this is big because we all know it's like life is very simple. Success, whatever success means to you in your life, it's very, very simple. All you have to do is take action. The only problem is we're not taking as much action as we should be. And so when I always tell people, I'm like, hey, do you know what you need to do to be successful? 95% of the time, somebody says, yes, I know what I need to do to be successful. I'm like, well, why are you not doing it then? Well, it's because, you know, I tend to procrastinate and sometimes I overthink and sometimes I get lazy and not really sure. And so it's not that we don't know what we need to do to be successful, whatever success means to you. It just comes down to we're not doing it. And so you have to ask yourself, what do I need to do to create the life I want? What do I need to do to stop procrastinating? What do I need to do to stop being lazy? And so if you're lazy or you're a procrastinator, this episode is for you. I'm gonna give you the five different things to help you stop procrastinating and to start actually getting done. Step number one is to stop lying to yourself. It's very simple, stop lying to yourself. Admit that you're procrastinating too much. Admit that you're lazy. Admit that you overthink and you're not taking action Said, Admit that you're getting paralysis by analysis because you're analyzing all the things that you're doing instead of actually doing the things that you need to be doing. It's like when you go through a 12-step program. The very first thing that you need to do is you gotta admit that you're, you know, if you're going through a 12-step program as an alcoholic, you've gotta admit that you're an alcoholic before you do anything else. Because all of the rest of the steps don't matter if you're not gonna be admitting to yourself and actually saying, oh, I am an alcoholic. So. The first thing you need to do is you need to stop lying to yourself. Admit, yes, I am too lazy sometimes. Yes, I, over, I, I procrastinate. Yes, I overthink. Yes, I get paralysis by analysis. Now that I've admitted it, now I can at least start to work through it instead of hiding from it. Because when I'm hiding from it, I'm not admitting it, it makes it really hard to work through it because I don't actually admit to myself that it's something that's real. So you've got to stop lying to yourself about it. You've got to call it what it is. And once you admit it, you can then start to work through it. And so here's the thing that I think. I don't think there's any proof in the world that this exists, but this is just my theory. I think that in humans are, humans are inherently lazy. I just do. I think most humans are inherently lazy. And I think it comes from our ancestors. Because if you think about this, you know, it's, if it's a hot day outside and our ancestors are in the middle of the, the Serengeti and it's really hot, there's only two real times that they're gonna be doing a lot of stuff. That's in the morning when the sun first comes up and it's still kind of cool and all of the animals are running around and they're up and awake and that's when our ancestral God and they would hunt and they would forage and then they would have it at sunset as well when it was cooling down again. They wouldn't be doing it when it's 110 degrees Fahrenheit outside. They'd be doing it when it wasn't the hottest and it wasn't taking the most from them. And so what were they doing throughout the rest of the day? I have the theory that they were probably just hanging out under a tree in the shade, doing whatever it is they need to do, eating the food that they got this morning, taking care of their family, putting the stuff together that they need to. And when they were doing the most was usually in the sunset and sunrise. So the majority of their time was probably spent doing not a whole lot, doing a few things, getting some stuff done under the shade of a tree or whatever it was, but the majority of their work wasn't happening then. And so I think that as a human, we probably have built into us trying to find the path of least resistance, trying to get out of things, trying to not work as much. And so when you take a human, thinking that our ancestors 100,000 years ago were probably hanging out under the trees and just chilling and being lazy during the middle of the day, and now you have a human, you, me, where we're sitting there and we're like, well, now I've got to get work done. I've got to be productive throughout the day. Maybe we've just got to come to the realization that we are inherently lazy. Now, just because we're inherently lazy does not mean that we can't take action, but we just have to admit, hey, maybe we'll just take full acceptance. I won't blame anything externally anymore. I won't talk about how it's this person's fault or this person's fault or this person's fault why I'm not taking action. I will just say, you know what? I'm a human. Humans are inherently lazy. I'm not going to be lazy forever. I admit it. I'm going to work through it. I'm going to take full acceptance but now I'm going to actually try to go through and create something with myself. So the first thing that I want you to do is just freaking admit to yourself. If you're lazy, call it what it is. If there's an elephant in the room, call out the elephant. The elephant in the room is lazy. So cool, you're lazy. Now we can go through and we can actually start working through it. So that's the first step. Step number two is to take your goals and to start to make them more bite-sized. 
make them easier to digest. Like if you have a, a big, huge T-bone steak in front of you, you're not gonna take the entire steak and throw it in your mouth. What are you gonna do? You're gonna take the steak and you're gonna make bite-sized pieces, and then you're going to chew on those pieces to make the pieces even smaller so that your body can digest it. And so one thing that I find that's really interesting about humans is that we'll look at like our five-year and our 10-year goals. And we'll be like, I wanna be worth $10 million and impact the world on this scale and have this and this and have traveled all over the world within the next 10 years. And we look at those goals and sometimes those goals are so big. And believe me, I love shooting for big goals and I do think there is, there is value to doing so, but there's more value in making it bite size. And the reason why is because when you look at those 10-year goals, they can seem so far away and they can seem so big that it's actually more demotivating than motivating. And so the thing that I think that you should do is take your goals and make them more bite-sized. You're not gonna eat the entire steak at once. You're gonna have little teeny tiny bite-sized pieces of that steak. And so I'll give you an example, right? I used to train a lot of sales reps. By the time I was 24, I trained over 2,000 sales reps. Almost every single sales rep that came into my office wanted to make $100,000 in a year because they never made $100,000 in a year. And so when they look at that, they're like, okay, I wanna make $100,000 this year. Cool. Well, what does that mean for this week? That's what's most important. And then what does that mean for today? How many phone calls do you need to make today? So it's good to, to have big goals and stuff to shoot for. That can be fun. But if you look at $100,000 and that $100,000 is 365 days from today, that can be demotivating. And so what you do is you take your goals, that $100,000 that you want to make this year, and you say, okay, well, if I take that and I divide it by, you know, 12, which is 12 months, which I can literally divide it by 12 months, that's about a little bit over 8,000. I think it's $8,333 a month is how much you need to make. Okay, that's a little bit more bite-sized. So that comes out to about 2,000 about $2,075 a about $2,075 a week that I need to make. Okay, cool. Well, what would I have to do as a sales rep to make $2,075 this week or whatever it might be whenever I do the math, right? And this is off the top of my head, so I don't uh, math isn't perfect in here. But you start to actually take that year-long goal and go, what do I have to do this week? What do I have to do today? And so if you look at it and you're like, okay, based off of my numbers, based off of my closing percentage, based off how many people say yes, how many people say no, I have to make 100 calls this week. Okay, I work five days this week, so that means that I need to make 20 calls today. So I don't want you to focus on the $100,000 you wanna make. All I want you to focus on is 20 calls today. And to make it even more bite-sized, I don't even care about the 20 calls today. I just care about the next call you need to make. That's it. And so now you're looking at, you know, th realize how much easier this makes it on you. Instead of focusing on $100,000, you're focusing on one phone call. And then when you're done with that phone call, you're focusing on the next phone call. And then when you look at that, done with that, that phone call, you focus on the next phone call. And so you take these big, huge, lofty goals and you make them bite sized because sometimes you're lazy or you're procrastinating because your goals are just a little bit too big and they're too far in the future and it's not motivating to go and search for something and to work for something that's that far ahead. You gotta get something right now that's immediate, that's bite sized and that's easier to digest. So number two is to take your goals and make them bite sized. Number three, the third thing is to find your why. Why do you want to do whatever your goals are? Why do you want to take action? Because if you don't know the why behind what you're doing, I'm going to be honest with you, it's going to be very hard to motivate yourself to also do it as well. My very first mentor, like burn this into my head. He used to always say, if the why is strong enough, the how will reveal itself. If the why is strong enough, the how will reveal itself. So if your why as to why you're going for your goals or why you're needing to take action or why you're doing this thing that you're doing today is strong enough, how it will get done is gonna eventually figure itself out. You'll figure out how to get it done. I'll give you an example. You know, if I said, I, I always say this all the time because it really makes sense for a lot of people. And, and this deals with your why, okay? If I were to say to you that, you know, if I were to ask you this question, I ask this a lot of times when I, when I speak live in front of people because I can see them raise their hands and everything. But I say, hey, what is the percentage chance? And be honest with me, don't lie to me, don't lie to yourself. What's the percentage chance of you making a million dollars this year? And everyone's like, you know, I say this on, sometimes on live lessons on Zoom and stuff, and it's like zero, zero percent, zero percent, zero percent, zero percent, zero percent. What's the percentage chance of you making a million dollars this year legally? It's like zero percent, one percent, two percent. Very, 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 very low numbers. Majority of them are zero. And I say, okay, I'm gonna ask you the same question, but a little bit different. What is the percentage chance of you making a million dollars this year legally? And if you don't, every single person that you love gets murdered. What's the percentage chance now? 
What do you think everybody says? 100%, 100%, 1,000%, 10,000%. There's no way on earth that I'm not going to make that million dollars. And I'm like, so what changed? The goal didn't change, million dollars. The time frame didn't change, a year. What changed? Your why behind why you want to do it. So it's never a fact that you can't get it done. It's just that you just don't give a shit enough at this point. And so you've got to find something that you believe in and that you want so badly, and you've got to have a strong why behind it. That's the difference. Where if you say, hey, you know, and I've told this story before, I had a, a, a coaching client, a one-on-one coaching client like six years ago, and he wanted to make $100,000 for the year. And I was like, why is that? And he told me why, and I said, okay, why is that? And he told me why, and I said, okay, why is that? And we went, why, 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 why? Originally, he wanted to make $100,000 for the year because he wanted to make $100,000 because he thought it'd be fun because he's never done it before and he wanted to make that much money. And then once we went deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, and deeper I found out the reason why he wants to make $100,000 this year is because he has two young children. He, he's divorced recently and his wife, ex-wife has custody of the children and she lives in a really bad part of town in New York. And his biggest fear in the world is that his daughter is going to get pregnant by the time that she's 13 and that his son is going to be shot in a drive-by. And he wants to make $100,000 so that he could put a down payment on a house so that therefore he can get custody of his children and at least put them into a safer part of town. I said, well, do you think that why is a little bit stronger when he can focus on his children's safety and wanting to make $100,000 and succeed because of them and their safety and wanting to help them in their life? Or do you think it's more motivating just to make $100,000? Right. It's when he finds his why, that's when you find someone that's driven. You don't have to search for motivation when your why is that freaking strong. So you've got to figure out what your why is. That's step number three. Step number four is to remove distractions. Remove distractions because throughout the day, you can tell me that you don't have time. And I can tell you that that's a bunch of BS because anybody can find time for something that's a priority for them. Because you're not just like, you know, sitting there staring at the ceiling all day long. You're not just sitting there hanging out. Oh, I've got nothing to do. I'm just sitting at the steel. You're doing something. You're either on your phone or you're watching Netflix or you're talking to people or whatever it is that you're doing, scrolling through, going onto YouTube, scrolling through different websites. I don't know what it is that you do on a daily basis. Go to ESPN.com and see what your favorite sports teams are doing. I don't know what you do, but you have to remove your distractions. And the thing that I recommend is if you really want to get stuff done, you want to stop being lazy. Don't like just literally best tip I can give you. Take your cell phone and put it in the other room for a few hours. Don't allow yourself to go onto Facebook. Don't allow yourself to go onto social media and have no other options but getting the things done that you need to get done. You have to remove all of your distractions. Turn off all of the notifications on your computer. All of them. Like if you send me a message, if you were to text me right now, there'd be no way for me to know until I pick up my phone later on down the road and, and actually open it and unlock it with Face ID. Like my phone does not light up with text messages. The only way that you can get a hold of me is if you call me. That's when my phone lights up and tells me. And so you've got to remove all of your distractions. You got to remove all of your notifications. You've got to let somebody know if you're working from home because of all the stuff that's happening. Tell your significant other, wife, children, whatever it is, whoever lives with you. When I put the sign on the door and it says this, don't knock, don't come in, give me time until I'm done. You can text me and I'll see the text a little bit later. And what you do is you actually dedicate time to being ridiculously centered and productive versus just trying to get things done throughout the day and then a notification comes through and then a phone call comes through and then an email comes through and this comes through and that happens and this happens and someone comes in and wants to talk to you, all of that stuff. When this sign is on the door, do not answer or do not come in through my door. If you work in an office with a whole bunch of other people and it's open floor plan, put your headphones on. And you know, people need to know around you, hey, if my headphones are on, that means don't come talk to me unless it's an emergency or something extremely urgent. And so you have a way for people to know, oh, Rob's working, I can't interrupt him right now. Oh, she's doing this, I'll, I'll talk to her a little bit later. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I make a mental note of it, I'll talk to him later. You've gotta have some way to have non-distracted time to work on things that need to be done. Whatever that looks like to you, that's for you to figure out. And so that's number five. Number four is to remove distractions. And number five, just please do this. You've heard me talk about it so many times you've been listening to this podcast. The Pomodoro Technique. Work for 25 minutes, take five minutes off. Work for 25 minutes, take five minutes off. Work for 25 minutes, take five minutes off. I don't need to tell you the science behind it, but I will tell you it has been proven the most effective way to use the human brain to be the most productive is to have one task that you're doing for the next 25 minutes and you focus on that one task and that one task only for 25 minutes. And then you take five minutes off and you just chill. You just, you know, hang out outside, look at the blue sky, 
go for a walk, whatever it is that you need to do that is completely opposite from getting the work done. And then after five minutes, you go back in and get the work done again. What I always recommend is have a pen and paper next to you, blank, notepad, and anything that pops up into your head. Because usually what happens is as we're working, we have something pop into my head and we're like, oh my God, I got to do this. And then we open up a tab and we start working on something for a minute. Whatever pops into your head in the time that you're working for those 25 minutes on one task and one task only, just write down on your notepad. You can get to that later and allow your brain to release the thinking about that thing so your brain can focus on the one thing that you're working on right now. Hey, thanks so much for watching this video. If you want to learn even more about mastering your mind, click right here and watch this video as well. We have all of the excuses. We're all so busy. Oh, I don't have enough time. To say that you don't have time, but you have a Netflix subscription, then you watch it, that's bullshit. You're lying to yourself.